<laughs> that listening to my goat. Ross, is that how? Listening to my uh, my goat. That listening to my that. You're listening to my mistake. <laughs> You're listening to that gets my goat. I thought you were better than that. So yeah, it's just a fun film. And it's worth going to watch if you haven't seen it. And if you have seen it, well, then you already know that. That was my take on the film. I really enjoyed all the all the little things, all the jokes. It was really funny. <laughs> you know, there there was a lot of fourth wall breaks that were not fourth wall break. He didn't turn and wink at the camera, but he'd say stuff like when he went back to the Xavier's school for gifted and talented uh, education. Okay. <laughs> he Did knocks... you purposely not want to say youngsters? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> he knocks on the door and Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Warhead. I was going to say Warrior, and I was like, that's not right. Uh, answers the door, and then you hear uh, Colossus in there talking <laughs> with his little Russian accent. And he's like, it's a big house, but I only ever see the two of you here. It's like they can only afford, the studio can only afford two X-Men. Stuff when he would say that kind of stuff. Just this obvious, we're making a movie. Well, the, the one that I liked was when Colossus thought he was talking to him, but he was actually talking to us. Oh, right. That I thought was really funny. Just the aside fourth wall breaks, like when he complained about Ryan Reynolds. Things like that. I, there's no chance we won't be seeing a Deadpool 2. No, definitely um, not. You and I open with that kind of a weekend without getting an immediate sequel. But I'm I'm fine with that. I, I look forward to it. I think, you know, if they can pull the same kind of thing off and not feel like they have to switch out switch things up or double the budget. <laughs> They I probably would really enjoy will, it. sadly. Now, did you ever feel like they went too far? It was R-rated. There was blood, sex, there was boobies. There was Profanity. cursing. I heard the N-word in one of those rap songs. Yeah, there was torture. Mm. Did you ever feel like they went too far? I, I guess I didn't. You know, at that panel in July, the audience just ate up the fact that there was the F word and, and, and the violence and all that stuff. And I just, yeah, again, I felt old because, you know, Tar Quentin Tarantino came along in the 90s. And, you know, I lived through all of that, guys. I don't need to see it again. But once I, in the context of the movie, I, like when he did the countdown, when he only had 12 shells and he'd count them. <laughs> I thought that that was very clever and very amusing, but it was super violent. Will you tell me? Are you were you fishing for something? Did you think? It no, went too I far? was wondering. I didn't think so at all. It's weird because I think back on it and I don't remember much of the violence. I do remember, you know, there was some bloody spots at the start when he was in that big fight with the countdown and the bullets and stuff. But it almost feels like it went away after that, and I'm sure it didn't. Oh, the part where he was breaking his hands on Colossus. <laughs> that, that was unpleasant. Okay, well, sorry. The, the, the other thing I wanted to mention now that we're at the end of the episode is, is the ripple effect of this, though, of this movie making so much money. And now it's just like, well, we can make grown-up comic book movies now. And the thing is, Dark Knight was a grown-up comic book movie. Winter Soldier was a grown-up comic book movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Deadpool's not the first one of these things. Yeah. What they're saying is that we can make R-rated comic book movies and they'll still make money. Yeah. They and so Fox... And Go ahead. I was going to say they immediately announced that the next Wolverine is going to be R-rated, which I'm not against. It makes sense. I mean, Wolverine is a guy with knives on his hands. So all he can do is stab people with them. And they've somehow skirted around. It's like the freaking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I was just thinking about this the other day because I was what my four-year-old son loves the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I was watching the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cartoon. 
these guys are ninjas, right? Okay. One of them has a set of swords. One of them has two sai, which are basically knives with, like, sword guard kind of things on them. Another one has a bow staff, which I guess is not all that lethal. And then one has nunchucks, which are also not all that lethal, but they're still... Banned in England. Yeah, they're still pretty bone-breaking, at least, uh, would be a common thing that would happen. But these stupid Ninja Turtles, they come out and they go, yeah, 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 and they wave their crap around, and then they punch people and kick (laughs) them. They have all these knives and swords, and they don't use them. They never, ever use them, and that's basically what Wolverine has been in all these other movies. He's been a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. He has knives on his hands, and we've never really seen him bloody anything. A Wolverine movie should be filled with blood, (laughs) because that's all he's got. He's got six knives on his hands, and that's what he does. That's funny. He's the best at what what he does, and what he does is not very nice. (laughs) And that's funny, because I could not disagree more vehemently. I don't think any of those X-Men movies or any of the Wolverine movies would have been any different or any better with an R rating. I don't think they would have um, been better. There's, there's no different? difference. The, the Wolverine, which I don't know if you ever saw. I didn't. I mean, the, the only difference is that you see blood when he kills a ninja. You know what I mean? He still killed a hundred guys in that movie and got shot a thousand times. Again, the power of the F word is if, you know, if the movie was rated R, then we could see blood and then we could hear the F word. But... I don't know how that makes Wolverine a better movie. It may not. I think what really is going to happen is they're going to be like, yay, we can make rated R movies. And they're going to make a bunch of rated R movies and a lot of them are going to fail miserably because the lesson that they'll have learned from this movie is rated R works. And that's not what worked. It, it was part of it that they weren't afraid to go there, but that's not why it worked. That's not the reason that I enjoyed the movie was because he cut some guy's head off. So I I don't see a problem with Wolverine being more dark because Wolverine sh- could and should be dark. But I don't think it's anywhere near going to guarantee a better movie. It's more likely going to guarantee a worse movie. Because at, at the very least with PG-13, they have to think about what they're doing. Okay, well, th- I agree on that. I thought you were thinking, well, it's about time. Wolverine is an R-rated character. He is, and but... And he needs to be in an R-rated movie. We'll see. I mean, that movie's already got a release date. And uh, I wonder if they feel that they need to. Like, if there was already a script. If they need to <laughs> Quentin Tarantino it up just a little bit before they actually shoot it. And I'll, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. They probably oh, well, hired him for a rewrite. Again, Winter Soldier was PG-13. And yeah, that you took your then two-year-old to that. <laughs> and I took you know my nephew when I think he was six to that. And, and we probably shouldn't have. Um, it was a grown-up movie. A PG-13 doesn't necessarily mean it's for everybody. And an R doesn't mean that it's... That it's more adult, you know? It's just uh, maybe more gratuitous, maybe more... I, Yeah, I, I, I don't know how different it would be. I, I think back before Nolan did his Batman movies, Darren Aronofsky was going to do Batman Year One, and they were talking about doing it R-rated. And uh, it, I would like to see just how different that would be. It's hard to say, because those were really adult flicks, the Nolan ones. And uh, where is the line between PG-13 and R? You and I have seen PG-13s where you're just like, wow, how did that get a PG-13? And then we've seen The Force Awakens where you go, wow, how did that get a PG-13? I mean, the rating means nothing, is I guess what I'm saying. But yeah, we'll see a bunch of uh, of things. And uh, do we have a rating on Suicide Squad? I think it's PG-13. I don't think they were shooting for R, but maybe I haven't paid attention to that. I saw the very first trailer, or my first trailer. I had never seen a trailer for it before, uh, today, before Deadpool. Although I had seen the panel at Comic-Con, so I felt like I was educated on that. That could easily be R, I think. It just, it, you know, it felt very dark and very yeah gritty and mature and gray and grim and all these G-words that the DC Cinematic Universe is. 
And I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody over at Warner Brothers said, ooh, do you see how well Deadpool did? How much time we got for reshoots? It's like, let's get Margot Robbie in a thong. In, in which case, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> in that case, but, Deadpool was not for naught. But I don't know. It, it doesn't have to be R-rated to be good or to be mature or to be hip. Maybe, maybe that's a lesson that they got from it is, you know, R equals, you know, exciting and the kids are all going to be talking about it. There was a big push. I don't know how big. There was a push that the studio put out a PG-13 version of Deadpool. You know, one of those worthless petitions. Got a million signatures on it or whatever, you know. It's like, hey, please put out a PG-13 so my kid can watch it again. And uh, I don't know what that movie would have been like as a PG-13. I mean, the, the intent has to be there from the beginning. We're making an R, we're making a PG-13. Because it does suck when somebody makes an R-rated movie and then it gets tr trimmed down to a PG-13. A lot of times you can feel that. Yeah, I I think they'd have to do a lot to it. Um, just taking the blood out would not be enough. Just put a CGing on uh, tops on the women in the strip club would not be enough. They'd have to change a lot, especially the torture scenes that he goes through to bring out his his gift. That stuff was pretty harsh. And I think pretty much all of that would probably have to go for them to get a uh, PG-13. So they'd have to basically rearrange that, which was the whole crux of the movie when it comes down to it. I mean, he just wanted to get that guy that did that to him. So coming up with, I don't, I don't know how far you can take it. I mean, when you talked about The Force Awakens, they had, I mean, that was rated PG-13. One of the reasons why was because of Force torture, interrogation, whatever it was, the, the stuff that he did to try and find out where Luke Skywalker was in people's brains. Didn't hold a candle to A New Hope. A New Hope was way more explicit than Force Awakens. And nobody talks about that being a... Well, Gino Moretto's wife does, but, you know, everybody else is like, yeah, that's a good family film. <laughs> Flying robot with syringes. Yeah, there you go. That stuff was softer by far than any of the torture that was going on in this show. So I don't know how far they'd have to bring it down. And, you know, if you bring it down at all, then it's less worthy of somebody spending a year to chase somebody down so that you can get revenge. Okay, well, it maybe wasn't a good question to ask. I just was curious. It did give them a certain amount of freedom to do what they wanted and go where they wanted and make whatever jokes they wanted. And, yeah, freedom is good. Yeah, it's weird. I've heard a lot of people talking about how they went to see Deadpool. And there was a whole row of three-year-olds. Yeah, people showed up with their children there to watch this movie. And there were people who walked out on this movie. Uh, it's weird because I feel desensitized. I've seen too much Tarantino or something, but I know that I haven't because I've hardly seen any Tarantino. But anyways, I watched that and afterwards I was like, oh, maybe I could take my kids to it. That wasn't that bad. Do you feel that way at all? Like, man, eh, that wasn't as bad as everybody said it was? Or was it as bad as they said it was and I'm just foobar? Well, you're foobar, but I don't think it was as bad. Yeah, I, I talked to coworkers. There was like, yeah, the pe a bunch of people with their whole families and six-year-olds and a whole bunch of kids who were there. And it, But I understand you become more sensitive when you see their children in the audience. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Suddenly, you start to think about it. And I, I think I told you this, but I haven't told it on the air. We went and saw Jurassic World opening night. Mm -hmm. And there were a whole shload of little kids there. And at the scariest point of the movie, on our row, or it might have been the row right behind us, this little kid, let's say he was five, was saying, I, I don't like it, Mommy. I want to go, Mommy. And, oh, I became so angry at the parent for bringing this kid in there. Because I was just like, oh, it's a fucking horror film. What are you bringing a little kid here for? But I realized that I was the only person in the theater who thought that Jurassic World was a horror film. 
And everybody else was like, yay, purdy dinosaurs, the land before time 14. <laughs> and then you start to think about it, a whole bunch of little kids. And, and is that movie appropriate for little kids? And, and uh, we had the same experience last weekend on Valentine's weekend. Okay. I went out with my wife and she wanted to go see me. She actually wanted to go see Deadpool. What? Which, I was. She kept you saying, "Yeah, have. that would have been a totally different experience." <laughs> she kept saying, "Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go see it," and I'm just like, "Okay, but you're not gonna like it. I mean, you're willing to, but in the end, you're you're the same person who was freaking out when the big spiders came out in Harry Potter." Oh, that's and right. She's asking like, me, I can't believe they're children. They, they, yeah, she was asking me, "What is this rated? What is this rated?" And I'm like, it "Doesn't matter what it's rated." You're an adult. You can see anything. <laughs> I remember you saying, you're 28 years old. Yes. What does it matter what it's rated? Yeah, I remember you you're saying. You're allowed in any rating, so it doesn't matter. So stop asking the dumb question that she wanted to go see Deadpool. And I was just like, I mean, I'll go see it with you, but I really don't think you're going to enjoy it. Unfortunately, we got out of, uh, we, you know, we went to dinner first. And when we finished our dinner, basically Deadpool started in two minutes from the time that we walked in and got into the car. And so I nixed that because I did not want to show up in, in late and you miss the sit, start. You have to sit separately on Valentine's <laughs> Day. <laughs> and then, yeah, there's probably that too. The theater would have been full. So we wound up going to uh, a different theater, which was still showing the last Hunger Games movie. Oh, and we okay. watched that instead. And so we walked into the theater and we sat down and on the same row as us, was a family with, uh, it must have been like five kids probably, and I think eight years old was probably the oldest one of them. And first of all, my wife just thought that was weird because it was like 10 o'clock that this movie was starting in the first place. She's like, what are they all still doing up? But yeah, then it gets to this scene. Oh my gosh, it got to this scene in the middle where they're in the sewers under the Capitol and, and the Capitol releases the mutts out to get them. And the mutts are the genetically altered creatures that they send down there. And these things are coming. You can hear them like whispering. Cat -ass. Cat -ass. And it is. Oh, see, that was from the first book. Yeah. And I remember saying, oh my gosh, how are they going to do that in a movie? They didn't. It was scary as hell hell this part this was really like they stopped in the middle of this to have like one scene out of a horror movie and it was just really freaky as these monsters are you know steadily closing in on them they're trying to, to move along to hurry and then they have this second where person standing there and they look and they see nothing behind them and then they you know turn around and they go a little bit and then they look and they're right there and these things were effed up creatures they were basically like mouths their whole face was a mouth with gigantic teeth and they were like fast moving crazy snapping dog type zombie monster things and yeah these little kids were sitting next to us just pissing their pants i mean most of them were actually asleep so <laughs> but yeah you could see what well, i could i could see one of them and it was the one that was probably the oldest i'd say maybe around eight and he was sitting, you know, his head back, pressed into the chair, and his eyes just wide as saucers, actively being scarred for life by this movie right there next to us. And yeah, it's funny. Some people just don't consider movies being scary like that. And I talked about that with a friend at work. Yeah, he was he was thinking it was funny because the same kind of thing. He was one of those people at Deadpool where a bunch of people showed up with all their kids and people were walking out halfway through and stuff like that. Then he remembered himself growing up in the 70s and going to see Jaws in the theaters and et cetera, <laughs> going to see Peckinpah films, <laughs> et cetera. So maybe times haven't really changed. I don't know. So people have been uh, neglecting their parental duties <laughs> for 40 years, kids. That's right. But yeah, that's pretty much all I got for Deadpool. Okay. Well, there's that. Gosh, I hope people got a laugh or two out of this. And if they didn't, we've already spent your money. So <laughs> what can you do? But yeah, feel free to let us know what movie you want us to uh, 
to go to next because you know I, I can, I'm willing to be a whore and, <laughs> and, and go see movies that people pay us to go see. I'll uh, do both of those things. Uh, Whatever. But I I would give it two thumbs up and say check it out and enjoy it. It's fun. It's it is gruesome. If you have a tender constitution, a tender soul, maybe you shouldn't go to see it because it might upset you. But you know what it is. It's enjoyable. It's a fun movie. So yeah, try it out if you're interested. It's definitely worth it. All right, I'm Big Anklevich. Just call me Angel of the Morning. That's right. Good night. Shoop, shoop, da doop. Oh, come shoop, on. Shoop, da doop. Shoop, da doop, da doop, da doop. Why do you have to ruin? <laughs> you know what gets my goat? That this show is produced under your Creative Commons 3.0 license. Why would you bother? Okay, pause, freeze frame. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Millennial Falcon. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> I saw that on Facebook and I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> just swag and the girl's got her hair all pink and purple and Chewie's got freaking hipster glasses on and he, see through feels wearing a fedora hey folks Rich Outfield here I'm going to do a little bit of solo work just just to fill time uh, usually when I edit the uh that gets my goat episodes. I, I sort of try and keep track of how long the episode is going to be and make a determination as to whether it's smarter to split it into two episodes or do one big episode. And it depends on how long it takes me, how much other stuff I've got going on. And then also just uh, if there's a natural breaking point. And on this one, I thought that I had split it pretty much in the middle uh, and there was a moment where it's like, okay, this feels natural to to stop. Uh, but now I've edited the second half, if you will, and it's only 20 minutes long. And I, I think there might have been some outtakes or something that made it look like it was more evenly cut in half. But I feel weird releasing a 20-minute That Gets My Goat. I, I shouldn't. I think when the show first started, we assumed they would all be about 20 minutes long. But I feel that I have made a mistake in splitting it and that I should have just waited a couple more days and uh, released a single Deadpool review episode. But what's done is done. I think I asked on Facebook, which would you rather have? And it came pretty evenly split. Take longer to do a longer episode or, uh, you know, we would like half of the episode right now. But because I made that mistake, and I feel like you deserve your money's worth for your free podcast, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what's going on with us right now. Big and I tend to get together every Monday night. We don't always podcast, but we try and get together. We'll have a meal and we'll talk. Usually talk about writing, uh, talk about what's going on in our lives. We just sort of hang out. It's become a tradition. We've done it for almost 10 years now, and uh, I like it. Most of the time now, when we record an episode, it's just in the car. It's usually in his car. We go to the Kohl's uh, department store parking lot because Kohl's closes early for some reason. And uh, there's nothing around that Kohl's. They built it on the outskirts of uh, town, expecting the city to expand. And it has, but uh, so far, it's just sort of muddy lots right now all around Kohl's, except for they did open that place, Fetal Photos, which is near Kohl's and uh, Ick. So we'll go in that parking lot and we'll be able to record, and it's usually pretty um, private. We've never had a policeman bother us. We've never had uh, you know, somebody knock on the window and ask what we're doing. But you know, we've got a lot of that gets my goats done recently, and it's up to me to edit them, and sometimes I drop the ball, but it's mostly that I just have other things that I've got to do or that I'm committed to do, 
And uh, I thought I'd talk about a couple of those things right now. Um, a couple of years back, we got together with Marshall Latham. He was visiting for work. And we met with him. We drove up to where he was staying. And we all recorded. Uh, I, I remember us recording a story. We recorded at least one podcast. It might have been more than one. And uh, we recorded some lines for his show, for Journey Into. And the most recent Journey Into episode is a double header, as they say, where there's two stories. And Big and I are on both of those stories. Our voices are. The first story is by Chris Monroe, uh, a.k.a. Munzee. And it's called What Price Convenience? And then the other story is called A Slight Delay by some guy named Rish Outfield. And uh, both of us and Marshall have our voices on those. Um, Bria Burton, who's also a Steve family member, voices on those. And uh, if you listen to that Journey Into episode, it's the last one he'll have in a while. Uh, he talks about how that story came to be. And he remembered it differently than I remembered it. Which is cool because I I knew that somebody came up with this idea and I just ran with it. But I didn't remember that it was Marshall that came up with the idea. And so that was cool. I, I suggest you go to it. It's www.journeyintopodcast.blogspot.com. He's also got a writing contest going on right now. Uh, I put the promo on last week, last time's episode, although I didn't have to. Uh, if I had known how short this uh, episode would be, you'd be hearing the promo now. But basically, he's got a 4,000-word cap of a short story, and you have to call your story Journey Into Something. And my joke to him was, Journey Into Journey. And it's like everybody's favorite 80s band is recruited to do battle against demons with the power of song. Um, don't stop believing, guys. Anyway, he's got a couple other restrictions. They're not very strong. It's just, hey, don't use the C word. Try not to have, like, really, really gory content. No explicit sex. Um, uh, no s &M without a safe word. Um, no clown shoes. And, and you know, I, we should have made that as a rule on Doonstief as well. But we didn't. So there's that. Big and I went and saw Zootopia. And he asked if people wanted an episode about that. And they said yes. So we've got that coming down the pipe. Big and I... Well, I went to a writing conference a while back. And I went to all three days. It was kind of a big deal to me because I liked it last year. And I wasn't able to go to all three days. This year I was, and I didn't get nearly as much out of it, which is just cruel, but that's how life works. But Big was able to come down on one day and go to the panels with me, and I was happy about that. I don't know that he was happier that he got anything out of it, but it's just, you know, it's good to have somebody around. He also wants to be a writer, and I hope that he got something out of it. I wrote an entire story at the symposium, just sitting around, waiting for panels to start, and... Uh, that's pretty cool. You know, it's March of 2016 when I'm recording this, and I've only written two stories, and I'm about half done with... Uh, I'm about two-thirds done with a third story, and I'll, I'll give you a hint. The title starts with Journey Into. Also, I've been doing some uh, audiobook narration. I got hired months and months ago to narrate... Kevin David Anderson's new book, Night of the Zombies. And uh, I got him all that audio, and he's listened to it all. And I think there were a couple of changes that he had me make. And then he got me a, a check. And, and that should be coming out soon. And if you know Kevin, he will relentlessly plug this book. And so uh, you will be reminded that it exists in the near future. And uh, you could check it out. It's it's a fun premise of a zombie uh, infection, you call it, you know, where where uh, a plague, an epidemic, maybe uh, in a small town. And it's really tongue in cheek. It's got lots and lots of 
pop culture references in it, a lot of James Bond references. And uh, I narrate it. I do all the parts, you know, all the voices. So, you know, if you like what I do, you will like this. And uh, let's see. We did a That Gets My Goat about the Writers Conference. And then we've got another one that will come out, I think, before the Writers Conference one, because it's, it's, it's sort of tied to something on the calendar. So that one we recorded yesterday. It has to be edited by me soon to make the day. Oh, but here's another thing. Uh, Su- Batman v Superman comes out really, really soon. And a couple of days ago, I got an idea for a uh, sketch that Big and I could do on the Dune Stephen. It was just a couple of days ago that I came up with it. That means, you know, I've got to write it, we've got to record it, then I've got to edit it, then he's got to upload it, and you've got to listen to it. So, you know, those are the steps for four and a half people to be entertained. The half is a person that started to listen to it, then got distracted and never went back. Basically, uh, it's going to be a fake Sean Connery thing. I, I started writing it last night, and I sent Big what I had so far. Uh, I've got that in front of me. I'll just do all the voices of one little part right now so you get a, a preview of that. Hey there! Oh no. A group of non racist, totally not ethnic street hoodlums. You need some help? Oh, they're coming this way. And these lads seem more like the type to watch Fast and Furious than Bond. <sighs> hey, old man, what you doing round here? I'm uh, afraid I had a bit of car trouble. Oh, look, it's that actor, Michael Caine. Awful dangerous around here at night, Jeeves. Well, I, I, uh, uh... Nah, guys, this is James Bond here. You know. What's his name? Uh, Roger Moore. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. You got a license to kill, Baldy? We're Jason Bourne fans around here, Grandpa. Yeah, your movies suck. All the clothes and cars and music are old, and they always hold the camera steady. Ah, leave him alone. He's gonna have a heart attack. Or wet himself. Come now, I'm not even the real Sean Connery. I'm the figment of a disturbed middle-aged kid's imagination. Wow, and he's got the, what do you call it, demonia. Dyspepsia. Dissentia. It's dementia, and I haven't got it. Oh, a little fire left in you, huh? Let's see you save the world now. I don't know why I shared that with you. Like I said, I'm trying to kill time. Trying to give you your money's worth on this dang episode. What else is, is, is still to come? We have recorded another episode of conversation for the Dune Steve for an episode that's not yet been finished. Uh, the produ- Sorry, for a story that's not yet been finished. We're having a little trouble finding appropriate voice cast. You guys can always let us know, especially if you are female, that you are willing to to help us out with that. There, I tend, when I produce, to go to the same voices over and over and over again because they're dependable And because I'm familiar with that, you know, I consider people like Renee and Marshall, Brian Lincoln, Julie Hoverson, you know, those, those kind of folks to be friends. And so, uh, you know, I always go to them over and over again, but certainly if you have something to offer and you would like to participate, you can let us know on that. Um, we have people that are offering to produce episodes for us or people that have their own shows and they always need new voices, new parts. Let's see. Um, I got another part for uh, the Campfire Radio Theater. About every year they give me a, a juicy role. And yeah, this one was the hardest. No, no, I guess the old. Well, this one was hard. I don't know if it was the hardest one they've had me do. Uh, and I've never edited that. Shoot. I got to start on that if they're going to get run it in time for Sam Hain. So, uh, lastly, uh, Abigail Hilton had me narrate half of her book, well, uh, 30% of her book, The Scarlet Albatross, and it's set in the world of Panamandora, 
where her cowrie catcher's books were set and uh, most of the point of view chapters are from a female perspective and so she got uh, also a friend of the dune steef uh lauren scribe harris to do all of those parts and then i did all of the chapters that were male centric or, or you know the the pov character was male and we had never done that before i had never done that before i know some professional audiobooks have tried that i i listened to the audio of the girl on the train i think by paula hawkins they made the odd decision of having the three different female point of view characters all voiced by different actresses or you know performers but they were all english and they all sounded vaguely similar and i just wondered you know do we get more out of that than if it was just a talented narrator who could just change her voice and i don't know but in abby's case it made for something very very interesting Scribe is fantastic when it comes to accents, and I think she sort of wanted to show off what she was capable of in this. And so I would try to match, if not the voice that she did, at least the accent. And there were a couple that were really hard. She is better than me at that. But there were a couple of characters where you know, they were significant enough in the book that I felt like I really had a handle on them. And... Uh, Abby is right now writing a sequel novel to that, and I was able to read a chapter of it and uh, able to slip right into those voices again, uh, which is nice. Anyway, that's called The Scarlet Albatross. It's available for purchase, uh, the text, on Amazon already. Um, you can buy it from Abby's website, which I believe is abigailhilton.com. And uh, you can listen to the audio that I did with Scribe uh, if you if you go to her Patreon. Eventually, I think it will be up there on, you know, like iTunes and Amazon. Maybe it'll only be Amazon. I, I'm not really sure how these things work. I should talk to Abby about it. But anyhow, the book is really, really solid. Really good stuff. And... Uh, Abby's a really good writer. As you probably know, I don't know. I mean, if you're listening to That Gets My Goat, then I'm assuming you're a fan of us. But uh, check it out. Or check out my reading of Hunter's Unlucky, which is a novel, a big epic novel that she had me do. Sadly, two years ago already. Well, less than that, but you know. She's got this kind of amazing thing for her Patreon fans that she will write a short story every month that is just for them. And they get to vote on who they want that short story to be about. And sometimes they're really, really small stories, she told me. But other times, they're big. And she had me do one called Taking Tricks that is about the character that I liked the most in Scarlet Albatross. And it's it's a production. I, I did the narration, and I'd say it's 90 minutes long. But a, a really cool story. It's about how two of the characters who are antagonists in Scarlet Albatross first met and be first became friends. And, oh, dude, that to me was fascinating. The, the, a, the fact that Abby has fans that want to know about minor characters or want to know about this character or that character because they love them or they, they're curious about them. And, and Abby is able to come up with a backstory for them or, uh, you know, a midquel, you know, some scene that wasn't in the book proper where the characters do something uh, or something about their childhood or all that. But it made me think about if I had a Patreon and I had fans that were like, oh, you know, we can't wait for another story. If I could do that, if I could write a story every month on demand for my fans. And, oh gosh, the the idea is really, really attractive as a challenge, as a, oh, I'd like to do that. The fact that people are giving me money in exchange for this story ostensibly, that would light a fire under me. That would motivate me to do more, to do it. Uh, and uh, 
I thought about it. You know, I, I've, I've written a sequel to this story that I wrote called Birth of a Sidekick. And that's the first project that I've done with sequels in mind. Uh, I wrote this this sequel. Uh, sorry, I wrote the first story in 2005, and it has an end, and it's over. But in writing the sequel, I came up with a bunch of possibilities, and I knew that it, the story had not ended. That we were going, I could tell more stories, and I've been thinking about that. Of people, what if they said, "Oh, we want to hear another adventure of Ben Parks," and I thought, well. I could easily write a short story that takes place in between those two stories, the first and the second. And, and anyway, just the, the thought of that, of doing that and having people enjoy it and look forward to it is really appealing to me. Um, I've been trying hard to be a writer this last month or so. And, and so I, I've got a lot of projects that I'm, I'm juggling. I put out a story called Lost and Found really recently. You can find it on Amazon.com. It's Lost Ambersand Found. And uh, I was going to include a, a little portion of the audio of that just to kill time, but I've been going long. I've been going as long as Big and I did talking about Deadpool. And so this to me feels like I, unnecessary. I don't have to play a clip of Lost and Found, but I will tell you what it's about there's this kid, Will, Will Choner. He's 10 years old and he has the ability to go places. It's an ability that he inherited from his father. Uh, but his mother has forbidden him to ever use this ability again because it killed his father. And at the very beginning of the story, the uncle, the boy's uncle comes to the door and he wants the boy to use this power to find a lost girl. And uh, I don't know that it's a great story. If you have ever listened to my podcast, The Rish Outcast, I always tell people, oh, it's not a great story when I write one. Um, but there are parts in it that I really, really like. And uh, it's also one of those where maybe if people wanted, I could do another story about Will. I don't know. Uh, Tom Tancredi a couple of years ago asked me, uh, you know, what I was going to do to fulfill my dream of becoming a professional writer. And I thought, I don't have a dream of becoming a professional writer. Where'd you get that? Uh, but here we are in 2016. And he's right. I want to be a professional writer. I want to be somebody who has fans and feels obligated to his fans uh, enough to get off my butt and turn off whatever I was going to watch and write and give them something because I want them to enjoy it. I want them to be entertained by it. I want them to say, oh, oh, cool. Where, what happens next? And that to me seems like what a writer does. I don't care about the money part of it, but I do care about connecting with a, uh, an audience, whether they're readers or listeners. And so very soon there should be an audio version of Lost and Found and uh, if you would like to go buy that, that's great. But more important to me, whether you buy it or steal it, is that you say that you liked it, or you want to know more, or that, you know, what about this, or where, what, where, what is this story really about, kind of thing. And yeah, there's only th three people in the world that know that what the story is really about, but that's not nearly enough. I want other people to to care. Uh, if you listen to that gets my goat, then I, clearly you care about us. We, I, I, I try big tries every time to make people laugh, to say something that we haven't said before, um, and uh, to have you guys just be in the room with us, a third friend there. Um, who's joking around or asking questions about what we've just seen or done. And uh, let us know if you really enjoy the show. Uh, let us know if there's something that we used to do that we don't do anymore. Um, because maybe I've forgotten. Maybe we can bring it back.
So uh, I think you've got your money's worth on this episode, guys. Uh, if you don't like me butting my big nose into the podcast I share with Big, then I, I won't do it again. But uh, you got twice the, sp- the, the, the space, twice the audio for half the price. Well, you know what I'm saying. And so I will leave you alone, and we will see you soon with uh, hopefully this fake Sean Connery spot, and then another that gets my goat. Fare thee well. Uh, oh, save that up just for you. Gross. Welcome to the show. <laughs>